then if I do that, then we can um, just put up our slides. Yeah, now, now I see your desktop. Okay, so it's, we're just, uh, okay. our slides are on the bottom there? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so now everybody that's on will see your desktop. Go to, oh, no, that's your inbox. Okay. You'll have to open it up. Wait a second, I'm going to open it up. So computer. Oh, yeah. Continue. Continue. I don't care about writing. There you go. There. So can you see that? Yes. Okay. Oh, perfect. So this, okay. Do you want me to make it? Yep, just make it, uh, just make the presentation at the bottom there. The, uh, that little button. little slideshow button. Oh, yeah. See, I'm not used yep. to this. I'm used to the old, uh, <laughs> the old version of this. Okay. So you're fine on your end? You can see it? I can see it. I can see it, too. Okay, great. So it's funny, it was actually this exact date last year that we did our last presentation. So time flies. Right on schedule. <laughs> yeah, this is January 9th, 2014. Was it as cold then? I can't remember. We're in a deep freeze here, by the way, so I almost didn't make it in. It was like minus, what was it last uh, night? With the wind chill, it was minus 8 last Celsius. Night. Well, it did dip to under 40 here in Tampa, which is um, quite an ordeal. 40 Fahrenheit. Yeah. <laughs> That's Fahrenheit, yeah. Uh, that doesn't even qualify here. That's balmy. <laughs> Some people won't even leave their houses here this morning. Oh, my God. <laughs> I could barely get my car started. You know what? This is what it really is nice to have a heated garage. Yeah. So we have radiant heat in the floor. Oh, that's, well, that's good for your car. <laughs> so um, my husband just turned it, like, not up far, but just enough so that I get in the car. It's like... I used to have to put a halogen light underneath the oil pan at night to keep it warm enough to start the next day. Yeah. You're wondering about bringing them back? I didn't, but you know how to do this finally the other day. Yeah, that's what we did last time. <coughs> After all these teleconferences, but it's not as good as it is, I could do it. Yeah, we're still waiting. Uh, there's a couple of us here, um, and uh, I think Dan should be on this morning. Uh, Susan, I don't know if you've heard otherwise. I didn't hear otherwise. Yeah. I was speaking to him last night, but he didn't, I mean, he didn't say anything that he wouldn't be. Yeah. But you, usually we get started, uh, you know, around 9, 10 or so is when everybody kind of was when we reach a critical mass, so. Okay. Um, but if uh, if you guys have any pressing um, issues with time, we can get started whenever you're ready. No, we should be okay. We only have one case, so. Um, okay. It, no, it probably won't take a full hour anyway. All right. Very well.
business class. Mm-hmm. That's not bad. It's an Indian airline. No, it's only our Canada. They lost uh, 2.2 billion. Hello, everybody. This is Janelle in Dr. Harrison's office. If you could remember to self-mute your microphone, if you're not speaking, that'll eliminate the background noise. My name is Jeff Sulfur. I'm a cardiac oncology fellow at the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center. I'm here with uh, Susan Dent. And um, we have a case to present this morning, which is actually an active case. So uh, I thought we'd maybe treat this a bit like multidisciplinary rounds. So I'll just advance the slides here. So the main topic of this is VEGF versus mTOR inhibition in the setting of dilated cardiomyopathy. So that's the uh, so that's the, the the clinical issue that we'll be exploring. So our case uh, involves a 67 year old male who presented with a renal cell carcinoma, and uh, his initial staging was negative for metastatic disease, and he underwent a nephrectomy uh, in uh, uh, mid August of 2013. The pathology report uh, revealed a 10.5 centimeter clear cell uh, renal cell carcinoma, high grade and nine retroperitoneal lymph nodes were removed and all were negative. He has a past medical history of COPD uh, and has an extensive uh, history of smoking. He quit about two months before his operation. 
uh, and he also has dyslipidemia. Now the backstory is that at the time of his renal cell carcinoma diagnosis, he was experiencing episodes of dyspnea uh, and was assessed in the emergency room where he was found to have congestive heart failure. He was having a paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and uh, quite severe lower extremity edema. And this was his first presentation. So in the emergency room, uh, a chest x-ray was performed, which revealed bilateral pleural effusion. And he had an urgent uh, transthoracic trans echocardiogram at that time. This showed moderate dilation of the left ventricle and severe global hypokinesis. And uh, his LV uh, e ejection fraction was estimated to be 20%. Um, at this point, he underwent a series of investigations to try to figure out what was going on. So here is his initial ECG, which uh, showed sinus tachycardia and some nonspecific ST and T wave abnormalities. Uh, I'll just mention, if anyone has any questions or would like to clarify any of the clinical issues, please uh, uh, stop me and, and uh, we can discuss as we go. Uh, the patient went on to have a percentine myoview, uh, which was negative for ischemia by ST segment criteria. The patient wasn't having any chest pain. He also had uh, a normal perfusion at rest and following stress. Um, it was decided not to proceed with an angiogram um, for, for uh, whatever reason, and it was felt that his dilated cardiomyopathy was non-ischemic. The etiology, though, it still remained unclear. Uh, I, I should mention there was no significant history of diabetes or um, heavy alcohol consumption. He was uh, initiated on medical management, so he was put on a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, a statin. Uh, he was put on aspirin. He was put on Lasix for um, the control of the edema, um, and his, his fluid status in, improved uh, significantly, and he was also put on a nitro patch. He had almost complete resolution of his clinical symptoms, and a repeat echocardiogram performed the following year uh, showed, an, uh, showed an ejection fraction improved to 38.7%, uh, and he was clinically stable. However, um, from his cancer uh, perspective, he had a follow-up uh, CT abdomen, which showed suspicious new lymphadenopathy in several areas, as well as the psoas muscle mass, and this was all confirmed to be recurrent metastatic renal cell carcinoma. So the question at this point was, uh, was what the optimal therapy would be for his renal cell carcinoma. Um, and of course, this choice, uh, looking specifically at the cancer, is driven by prognosis. And so good prognosis patients are usually offered first-line vascular endothelial growth, growth factor inhibitors. And there's a few examples here, including uh, sunitinib, pazopinib, and, and a newer one uh, named axitinib. In patients with poor prognosis, they often go on to receive uh, mTOR inhibitors first. And uh, in, in Canada, two options that we have are temsorolimus or, or um, a sister drug, everolimus. And uh, just to remind everyone of the pathways involved with, um, with renal cell carcinoma, um, VEGF inhibitors basically in, inhibit the um, VEGF receptors, um, which prevent um, the process of angiogenesis, and that's the whole basis of this therapy. mTOR inhibitors do a, a very similar thing, but they go down a subsidiary pathway, the mTOR pathway, which inhibits um, this molecule named hypoxia-inducible factor, which inhibits downstream angiogenesis. Here's a few examples of uh, VEGF inhibitors in common use. So in renal cell, uh, likely these two are the first-line options here, uh, sunitinib and uh, pizopinib. Uh, and both have been uh, studied extensively in renal cell carcinoma. Here's a, a schematic of um, the inhibition pathway. So these are tyrosine kinase, these are small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So they do have a lot of toxicity associated with them, and one of the main ones is hypertension. Combined with proteinuria, there is some evidence for LVEF decline, especially in the, in the initial trials. There's also a risk of arterial thrombosis, as well as a host of other issues, including diarrhea, hand foot syndrome, liver dysfunction, nausea and vomiting, and fatigue. 
Uh, this was a paper published in The Lancet in 2007 investigating the hypertension issue. And uh, at doses of approximately 50 milligrams, uh, four weeks on, uh, two weeks off, about half of patients develop hypertension. And the mean maximum increase is around 30 milligrams of, of uh, mercury systolic. So it's a fairly significant spikes in blood pressure. Some people feel that this may be a marker of efficacy. Um, and in addition, there are known EF drops, even when ACE inhibitors and beta blockers are used to treat the hypertension. I dug this out, actually one of our, our uh, colleagues dug this out of the supplementary material on one of the big papers looking at the use of pazopinib uh, in the treatment of renal cell carcinoma. And there is a, certainly a significant risk of LV decline with these drugs. So looking here, about 7% uh, about of patients treated with pazopinib can expect uh, a greater than 10% absolute decline in LV EDF uh, when compared to baseline. So there are, there are known issues here, um, and these drugs have not been used uh, for, for, for very many years, so, so a lot of data is still, still coming out on this. There is also a risk, as mentioned, of, our, of our arterial thrombosis. Um, this was a meta-analysis um, published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, looking at about 10,000 patients um, receiving either sunitinib or, or a sister drug, serafinib. And the overall rate of our arterial thrombotic disease was about 1.4%, and the relative risk increase on meta-analysis was about 3. So looking at the lower uh, confidence interval here, these drugs can increase your relative risk of arterial thrombosis by at least 25% looking at this meta-analysis. So, so this is a significant problem as well. mTOR inhibitors are a little different, um, and the side effect profile is a little different, and it's felt that they may be a little more gentle on the heart, and they have, le they have less of an issue with um, hypertension. So the main issue with these are uh, immunosuppression, hyperlipidemia, delayed wound healing, and a few other minor issues, uh, including slight increased risk of lymphoma, various infections, and angioedema. So this patient was initially presented uh, before Christmas at our multidisciplinary cardiac oncology rounds, and the recommendation at that time was to choose the best first-line therapy for the renal cell carcinoma, so either Sutent or uh, Sunitinib or Pazopinib, uh, as this patient was felt to have a good prognosis when looking specifically at the renal cell carcinoma. It was recommended that he have close follow-up with cardiology after about two weeks of therapy, and a MUGA to be arranged about a month after initiation of therapy, as well as referral to the cardiac oncology clinic. This patient was being followed by the Ottawa Heart Institute, uh, but it was felt that some co-management with um, the cardio oncology clinic may be useful. Uh, at this point, I'll stop. Does anyone have any questions about this case or any advice, or would they have done anything differently? Hi, this is Arthi Patel. I work with Dr. Harris, and I'm an advanced imaging fellow. Hello. Um, hi. I had a, a question um, in regards to the patient's cardiomyopathy. Was there ever consideration for cardiac MRI? So that's a good question. We, we do have that capability here in Ottawa. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell from the notes. Uh, unfortunately, this was a bit of a secondhand uh, case presentation because I'm not directly involved with this patient. But it doesn't seem that that was discussed. Um, but that would be a very good idea. And I think that's something that, that, that should be considered. And this issue came up last year with our, our uh, similar cases. It, it, for some reason, it seems not to be done routinely. Um, yeah, and, and we've only had it here in Ottawa for, uh, I think, a few years. So I, I think that's a very good point. How, uh, how do you think that might be useful for uh, um, helping discover what the etiology might be here? Well, I think when the initial evaluation uh, is unclear, um, uh, you're looking for maybe some sort of inflammatory or infiltrative uh, cause that can help rule those out. Um, and really, I think it can also uh, be an, another objective measure of ejection fraction. Uh, in, in these patients with uh, decreased EF. Thank you. So 
So unfortunately, the um, SEGA continues with this patient, and, and we were awaiting approval for treatment with pizopinib, um, and the patient ended up having a subsequent MUGA. And this revealed an EF of 24%, uh, despite medical optimization. The patient fortunately remains clinically asymptomatic, but is having progressive metastatic disease on repeat staging scans. So he's having enlargement of the psoas muscle mass and enlargement of the lymphadenopathy, and now he's having lower back pain. So this, of course, is making everyone nervous, um, especially his treating on oncologist about the best treatment option. And I'm, I'm curious to see what people would recommend for his cancer therapy, whether they would still be comfortable proceeding with pizopinib, so the VEGF inhibitor, or abandoning that idea and moving on to an mTOR inhibitor, which may be the inferior treatment for the cancer. I'd be interested to see what, uh, what people's opinions are on that. Yeah, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a challenging case, and um, these drugs are not. I, I mean, as I said, we don't have a lot of experience long term with these drugs, and so I think that's what's making everyone a bit uncomfortable. I, I think my my perspective with this patient is that overall his prognosis is is not good, and and his lifespan is likely measured in months to possibly a few years, and so um, whatever decision is made for his cancer care, I think it will, you know, it will be limited. You know, I guess my question is, from the cardi for the cardiologist, um, with an EF like that of 24% despite medical management, I mean, we can talk about the prognosis for, from a cancer perspective, but um, his prognosis from a cardiac perspective also I don't think is great. So what, what do people feel like might be his prognosis from a cardiac perspective? irrespective of his cancer, given that type of um, picture, cardiac picture. This is Samir Dadal from Tucson, Arizona. I think, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I think going back to the uh, initial uh, workup, there is a good likelihood that he might have three vessel disease, which would give you a, a false negative uh, nuclear study. Uh, the fact that his EF dropped on the same medical management without any intervention kind of also raises the suspicion. So there might be a reversible cardiac cause at this point to improve his LV function. Uh, so that would be the first thing I would pursue to see if there's any, uh, with an angiogram or with a cardiac MRI, whichever, uh, is available and uh, would expedite things. And if there is a reversible cause, and you, uh, I wouldn't send him for bypass, obviously, given his overall picture, but if there is a stentable LED or uh, disease, we've had patients that we've stented their left main to help, uh, case, uh, to help their uh, clinical course along, that might be an option that would help things also. So I don't think that workup is complete yet. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this is uh, Greg Hartledge here in Tampa uh, again, and, and I agree with that 100%, you know, especially given the sort of um, the potential precipitation of uh, manifest ischemia with um, the VEGF inhibitors as well. Um, also, I think that with the VEGF inhibitors that, you know, what we, from what we know that for the most part these are reversible cardiomyopathies that when treatment is either withdrawn if need be or completed that these people for the most part um, you know obviously based on somewhat limited data overall but that for the most part they improve um, you know so that would be something that would be um, that would be reassuring um, knowing that he did not have any other underlying cause of heart disease that you would potentially exacerbate, you know, like the coronary um, disease that Dr. Dadal just uh, outlined. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I, I, think, I think in this patient what we'll probably um, be looking at then is cardiac MRI first. This patient is being seen urgently um, next week. Um, in the cardio-oncology clinic, and I, I, I suspect that, uh, that that will likely be the next course of action. I, I had a question about uh, uh, defibrillator uh, use in these sorts of patients. I, and I'm curious, what would be the, um, the recommended life expectancy in a patient 
before that would be considered. Which, which you want patients to have a fairly good overall prognosis from cancer, or what would be your, your criteria? Okay, um, can you um, restate the question? I'm sorry. I so, I mean, I, I, my understanding, I, I'm not a cardiologist, but my understanding is when EF starts to fall below 30%, there's consideration for insertion of a uh, defibrillator in healthy, in otherwise healthy patients. Would that, do you think that would be something to be considered in this patient, or is it a bit premature? Um, so they need to have at least a one-year life expectancy with reasonable quality of life. Okay. Um, and then also, um, notwithstanding that, you know, you have to rule out pretty definitively any reversible causes of the LV dysfunction. So I think that um, the cardiac MRI or, you know, there, there are other non-invasive ways, a, a cardiac CTA uh, in the setting of good renal function. I know he's had a nephrectomy, so that may be um, a, a Yeah, he problem. has creatinine right now of around 200, so. Okay, yeah. You know, but um, um, I, I do... I do think that um, those considerations uh, would probably be limitations in this patient, and um, you know, wouldn't it wouldn't be um, a priority at this point, uh, given his metastatic disease. Right. So we have bigger fish to to, to fry first, then. Eh? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think that was it. Right? That's you know, a fairly um, a fairly quick case. Certainly one that's causing us a lot of. Um, clinical issues here, and, and I, I thank everyone for their advice, and I'll certainly be passing that on. It's an active case, so I'll certainly be, be uh, passing on everyone's advice to uh, th this patient's cardiology team. Thank you very much. I, I did have a quick question. Um, sure. Did he uh, demonstrate any other side effects um, from the VEGF therapy, such as hypertension, all of, or is that fairly controlled? So he hasn't begun this treatment yet. Um, so, because uh, he, he basically presented with metastatic disease just a few months ago. So he's being considered for treatment of the metastatic disease with these medications. But um, there's no evidence at this point for adjuvant therapy in metastatic renal cell with these drugs. There, there may be some evidence soon, but um, usually these drugs are reserved for the palliative setting. And he, he, hasn't, be, he hasn't begun uh, treatment yet. Okay. I think he should soon, uh, or else the renal cell is going to get out of control. I, mean, I think it already is, but uh, but yeah, thank you for that. Okay, any other questions or comments from the group? So the ICD uh, question, it, it's he'll fall under the class three because it says that you have to have acceptable functional status with a reasonable expectation of survival for at least one year. So his functional status uh, will go in there, and that's a class three level of evidence C uh, at this point. Okay. But no other questions. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Thank okay. you, guys. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, your time, and uh, this was a, a great uh, a great discussion, and we look forward to the follow up and hope for good news. Yes, we'll certainly keep you uh, up to date. At the next uh, case okay. webinar, maybe we'll give you guys an update. Okay. That would be great. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Stay warm up there. <laughs>